You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. I was a little worried, guys. I was a little worried with how last week went that this wasn't necessarily going to be the uh, happiest of atmospheres. Thankfully, the Kings got the win last night over the Utah Jazz. I don't know what we're necessarily rooting for. Right now, the Suns are up big on the New Orleans Pelicans, but the Kings and Suns are battling right now for a play-in spot. I I guess we'll just start with kind of both of yours opinion or consensus on like where we're at with the Sacramento Kings right now, the, the, the tough losses that last week, the injury bug that they're dealing with. G-Man, we'll start with you because you're in the building every single night watching this team. What are you seeing from this group? And I mean, we're it's the home stretch, right? Eight games remaining. So what are you expecting and, and what do you think this team is attempting to do to overcome the adversity that they're facing right now? Well, I think you, you have to be a realist. Um, I am not overly optimistic. I I wish I were more optimistic. But if there's been a a trademark of this team in my mind, and Jerry, you you can help me out in this situation. You look over 39 years of the Kings in Sacramento, I don't know that there's ever been a more inconsistent, head-scratching kind of a team than what we've seen this year. And that's, that's a great frustration to everybody. Because we all know how, you know, there have been games that you look at and you say, hey, those should have been W's. And I think over the course of 82, and I've said this countless times over the years, there's a handful that you don't expect to win that you win. There's a handful that you don't expect to lose that you lose. That's just life over an 82-game season. But the ups and downs of this team and the fact that there have been I don't know, nine times they've been, they've lost by 20 or more. They've, they're good in games decided by five points or less. I think the record is 13 and eight. So it's, it's hard to put a, to get a real pulse. You mentioned eight games left, six of the eight are against teams with winning records. Every game now is a must win scenario. And last week was super disappointing in terms of the two losses to Dallas. Uh, It didn't help the fact that you get the famous NBA two-minute report after the second game that with 50 seconds to go and the score is tied, there was a foul that wasn't called on Harrison Barnes that should have been called, and that could have been the difference in the ball game, and it could have given the Kings the tiebreaker against the Dallas Mavericks, and instead they're two games behind Dallas now. And so those are the things that you have to deal with, and it's frustrating, it's aggravating at times, but you still have got eight chances. So in my mind, the scenario of making the top six, I think that ship has sailed. I think it's gonna be a play-in scenario. And what I'm hoping is that somehow, whoever you play, you get home court for that one game. Because that, that's, you know, one and out, man. It's so tough. So I, I babbled too much here about that. But uh, Jerry, tell me what you're thinking. Well, I, I wish I could disagree with you, <laughs> but no, I, I think it's a case where the the Kings. I, you know, basically, I'm just a fan. I just enjoy the. I enjoy this team. Uh, they've certainly, you know, been disappointing a number of times. But I, I think for a good team and a winning team, they have been unusually inconsistent. Yeah. I mean, as you you know, and a lot of you Kings fans know. Uh, I've been around some teams, and Gary has, that have been very consistent, consistently bad. <laughs> and and so, uh, but this this is a team that, you know, depends on the three. This is a team, I think, if they make their threes, they can beat anybody. When they're not making their threes, anybody can beat them. You know, and, yep. and they're just a little bit too one-dimensional, I think. And then the other side, I think, from the standpoint of the playoff situation, Last year, the Kings were very fortunate. They had no injuries to speak of, uh, snuck up on a lot of teams. Uh, This year, sneaking up on nobody. Didn't really improve the roster, to be truthful. And the the other good teams in the West stayed healthy, for the most part, and added players. And that's kind of the bottom line. Yep. 
the play-in tournament is still relatively new, right? It's still relatively fresh. We've seen a handful of years of it. I think it's a complete success for the NBA because it adds drama. But we've all experienced it as team as a team that was either out of the playoffs completely or already clinched a playoff spot so we could watch it from a enjoyment standpoint. Now, it likely, we're going to have to watch it from a stressful, like, one game, essentially March Madness college basketball tournament type, uh, type standpoint. What terrifies me about the play-in, amongst many things, G-Man, you kind of touched on a little bit, like it's one game, anything can happen. Yeah. And especially because with the exception of the Los Angeles Clippers, the play-in tournament right now is the entire Pacific Division. You have stars on every single team in that, that group. You have the Lakers with LeBron and AD. You have the Warriors with Steph Curry. You have the, the, the Suns with Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. And then you have the Kings, who we believe have stars in their own right. De'Aaron Fox, Demonte Sabonis. Sabonis having one of the greatest seasons ever since Wilt Chamberlain, really, as a, as a big man, not getting enough respect for that. But what, what terrifies me about the one-game scenario, and I'm not necessarily a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but anything that happened in those one games, and we saw it in Game 7 of Kings and Warriors last year, all Steph Curry, Steph Curry can go for 50 points at any time, and, and that's it. So I'm curious your guys' thoughts on the play-in scenario, if the Kings end up taking that route, which is more likely to them. If it, it, I mean, it's, I think it's obviously a success for the NBA, but how you think the Kings should approach a game like that and how you feel a game like that means or helps a team that's trying to build into a playoff perennial team? Well, I think if, if, from my standpoint, you hope that the experience of last year, you've learned from it, that it will help you in your continued growth. Uh, things don't happen quickly in terms of the NBA. You look at Denver, Michael Malone has done marvelous things, but they've given him kind of free reign to handle things. And it took them, I think it was the third year before they advanced yeah. in the playoffs. And I look back at the heyday of the Kings under Rick Adelman, and I think it was the third year, third year in the playoffs before we got out of the first round. So the beauty of the play-in situation is, you look at last year's example, Miami came out of a play-in scenario, and they get to the finals in the Eastern Conference, they get to the finals all the way around. Uh, Lakers came out of a play-in scenario last year, and they get to the Western Conference finals. So it can be done. There's no question about that, but it is... It is scary. You know, you're going against superstars and you're going against teams that have got talent and everybody's determined that they're going to make that pay off. Well, how tight are they going to make the calls on that particular night? Will it be different than what you saw the week previously? There's so many factors you just don't want to have to risk. But I think the reality is that's where the Kings are and that's probably what they're going to have to deal with. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt. I think there, I think there'll be... The one thing about the... The play-in, I think, is, is interesting to me for a team like the Kings is, like you said, they've, they've been through it a little bit, and they're, you know, they're capable of really having those great shooting nights, and uh, certainly they're capable of, of be, we've seen they have a winning record against the top three teams in the West. Yep. So you know on a one-game situation they're capable of beating anybody. Uh, you know, so that's that's really encouraging to me. Uh, I don't know how it's going to play out, but uh, you know, there's no reason for the Kings to be scared to play anybody because they've beaten them all. Yeah. You know, they have beaten the Lakers and the Suns, and they've beaten the best three. Now, and a, it's a one-game deal. Uh, you know, go go play your best. I, you know, I'm one of those people. You know, being an old fart. Uh, I didn't like the play in when they put it in. Now I really like it. I think you know, it's been marvelous. I mean, it's really a lot of fun. It really has brought excitement. Yeah. And so I, I have to kind of apologize for being such an old curmudgeon, but uh, I really ha do like it. And now for the Kings' stake, I, I think it can be. I think it can be great. I'd be. You know, I just would soon take the uh, optimistic standpoint and and. You know, as far as the play, and they'll be as good as any team in it. So, why not? <laughs> what about the in-season tournament? What did you think about the in-season tournament, both of you, but G -Man, or Jerry especially? I it's... hate it. I hate it. My God, that's good Lord. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Adam Silver's trying to change some things and make some things new. And oh. I guess I understand that. I think they need to put clown shoes on them and red noses and just make it official. 
<laughs> well, it's it's perfect. It's fitting that the first ever play-in tournament, the Lakers won. Yeah, well, yeah, they, 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 I think the league uh, demanded that. Yeah, the, the Lakers will win all the titles that don't matter. The play-in yeah. tournament, the Disney bubble tournament, that's yeah, what the Lakers win. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious from everybody here by either show of hands or cheering or whatever, how many of you are, are optimistic or positive that the Kings will not just make the play-in, but actually make the playoffs? Oh, yeah. Woo! Fairly good. There you go. There you go. Decent yeah. optimism. Hey, there's always time to be a pessimist. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, I mean, there's no reason to rush into it. For sure. The, the, the route, though, got a lot tougher with the loss of Malik Monk specifically. Kevin Herter was a tough blow as well. But Malik Monk, in particular, Malik Monk really was a blow that you could even see the team react to when he went down. Malik is on a contract here. We don't know if Malik is coming back. Hopefully he hasn't played his last game. You, you hear Mike Brown and the players talking about kind of this cliche, and you dealt this, with this as a coach a lot, like kind of a next man up mentality, but what does that look like, replacing a player that's almost impossible to replace in Malik Monk and what Malik does? How do the Kings replace the, the injury issues that they're, they're dealing with right now when they don't really have time to figure it out? There's no practice time. It's the end of the season. They have to figure it out now. What do you think they do? Well, uh, uh, first of all, the next man up, it's interesting because in reality, the next man up isn't nearly as good. So that's a problem. Now, so you can't solve it with the next man. It has to be uh, several guys. I mean, and certainly whether it's Davion Mitchell and Keon Ellis and Keegan Murray's got to do more. It'll have to be a combination. But Ken, in my opinion, they can't replace Malik Monk. And, and on the other side of it is they've got to keep Malik Monk because, in my opinion, he's the third most talented player on the team. And so you don't get better by losing your third best player. They seem to agree. I agree yeah, too. Absolutely. He brings a, he brings an energy and an excitement and he's such a free spirit and a character. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed getting to know him a little bit over the course of this season. And it's devastating when you see a guy like that go down. And like Jerry says, you don't, it's, it's not the next man up. It's everybody, and I think we saw it last night. You've got to get 20 plus points from Harrison Barnes. You've got to get 20 plus points from Keegan Murray. You've got to get Davion Mitchell, Keon Ellis, Kessler Edwards, these other guys giving you a little bit more. Well, one night against a team that was missing three of its key players and had lost eight in a row, isn't really a true indicator, but it's a step in the right direction. And so can we see that now tomorrow night against the LA Clippers? Can we see that when we have a back-to-back -back on Thursday and Friday, New York and Boston? Man, that's tough, tough sledding coming up here. So you're gonna have to see it if you wanna keep your head above water. So that's a huge loss for Malik. And you know, Kevin Herter's a huge loss as well because I don't think he gets the credit People seem to live and die by whether or not he makes a three-point shot. But the things that he's not a great defender, but he's savvy, and he gets a lot of deflections. His basketball IQ, I think, is pretty doggone high. And I like the way that he compliments Sabonis and others in, in the half-court situations. And so those are two big losses you have to, to have to deal with, and that's reality. And that'll make it tough for the Kings. And G... In addition to the access that you get, obviously, at home games, you're, you're traveling with the team. You're on the road with them a lot. What kind of impact do those two players, and, and I mean, we can see it a little bit in the locker room and their on-court chemistry and stuff like that from a media perspective, but from what you see with them on the team playing, not just Malik and Kevin, but that team as a whole, how would you describe the camaraderie, the chemistry, the relationship of this group and their ability to kind of come together at this point in time in this difficult spot and kind of see it through. Harrison said something I loved after last night's game. He said, kind of the approach to the rest of the season is the only way is through. It doesn't matter who we're playing, doesn't matter the circumstance, we just got to play through it. When you look at this group and you've experienced this group off the court, what about them stands out or what do you think Kings fans should know about the group of guys that they have? Well, first of all, I think they like each other. I think they genuinely enjoy each other's company. And that's so important in terms of chemistry. 
and I give the credit to Mike Brown. From the get-go, when he came in, he talked about an organization that he saw from afar that didn't have a collective soul, and how important it was to have a soul. And everything is based like a family. And in, in this group, with from the head coach, uh, Monty McNair in the, in the front office, Wes Wilcox, uh, the assistant coaches, one of the things that the Kings do on a regular basis on the road is we'll get together as a group. And it includes people like me. And I'm not used to that because, you know, teams usually want to be a little bit seclusive. Uh, they want to be uh, isolated among themselves, coaches and their players. It's like us against the world. But under Mike Brown, you're part of the family. And it's, it's so nice to be able to know that when for instance, we're going to go on the road, and I know in Oklahoma City at the end of this trip, on the night we get there, they've got one of the restaurants reserved in the hotel. Everybody's invited to come and sit down and break bread and have a great meal. And that happens on a regular basis on the road. So in a long way around the, the horn here to explain, these guys and this group like each other. And it it just, I think that's worth, to me, over 82 games, and Jerry, I don't, I'd be interested in your thoughts. I think good chemistry can win you six, seven ball games out of 82. Oh, I, I totally agree. I mean, and you're, and you're never going to win big without it or, or be a winning team without it. I, like I say, I, I think, uh, you know, over the years, you know, clearly you can see the guys are unselfish and they like playing with other. I mean, it almost goes back to, honestly, the, the best chemistry maybe until now was the very first uh, edition of the Kings, you know, the Mike Woodson's and, yeah. the, and Eddie Johnson's and LaSalle Thompson's. I mean, the chemistry was tremendous. Yeah. And uh, at that time, you know, they weren't as talented as this particular team, but they got more wins maybe because of it. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Kind of to speak to what you talked about, about Mike's inclusiveness, there have been a number of occasions where we've stayed late after practice because Mike will bring media members out to the floor and will actually walk us through some of the sets, which is pretty incredible. And I don't know any coach that in their right mind would ever do that. I'm curious from your perspective, too, from a coaching perspective, obviously there's, there's here's your chance to take a shot at people like me us media members running our mouths, acting like we know what the heck we're talking about. But for a coach to bring us out there and not give too much away, but walk us through, this is what we're trying to do, this is what we want to do, the X's and O's. Have you ever heard of that before? Has any coach ever done that in your career? Did you ever do that? Hell no, I wouldn't do that. No, I've never really heard of it. I mean, I think it's great. I don't think there's any downside. Uh, I think it's a good move by Mike. I think he's, he's great with the press and, and really has a great rapport. And I've never heard a, a bad word about him from anybody that's ever worked for him or, or, or and, and all that. So, no, I think make, it's a good move. I just never – I never thought of it, and I don't know of any other coach that did. I know, I, I know one thing. You wouldn't catch Rick Adelman out there doing it. <laughs> be, that'd be uh, – that'd be, uh, if you had a list of 100 things uh, Rick would do, that'd be – it wouldn't be on the 100. <laughs> it's impossible for us to not make comparisons, I think, between the late 90s, early 2000s Kings with – this year's Kings, considering this is the first team to make it since that 06 at the very latest time. And a comparison that I've kind of been workshopping and thinking of has been kind of a comparison between Keegan Murray and Peja Stoyakovic. Not necessarily a one-to-one -one comparison of type of player, but both players really early in their careers, I think we're expected to take on a lot of the scoring load. Now, Keegan this season has really stepped up as a defender, which I think is pretty incredible. But especially now with Malik Monk out, Peja between his second and third seasons jumped from 11 points a game to like 20 points a game, which is a ridiculous jump. Keegan's jumped from 12 to 15 in his first two seasons. But I feel like, guys, that, that acceleration button, the fast forward button has been hit a little bit. Now that these injuries have, have appeared, how much do you think Mike Brown and the Kings are turning to Keegan like, I know it's your second year, but we need you now kind of sh hit that fast forward button a little bit. Well, I, I think they certainly, uh, it, you know, need him uh, to do more. He's capable of doing more. And, and I've said on, on several podcasts and radio at times, uh, uh, I love Page. I'm a huge Page fan. But Keegan Murray is better in his first year than Page. He's better in his second year than Page was. I don't know that he'll be better than Page in his fifth year. We don't know that. 
but at some point, uh, he's also played on a more winning percentage games. So I, 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 I get a little pissed when people can, uh, you know, basically expect him to become uh, LeBron James in the second year. Uh, you know, he, he's on track to do everything you could expect out of him. He's a terrific young player. Uh, I get, uh, I, I'm probably outspoken here, but I, I get so ticked at people saying, well, he doesn't show enough emotion. Well, hell, how much emotion did Tim Duncan show? <laughs> huh? Good grief. It's a matter of uh, just, he comes to play every night. Uh, he's, he's durable. You know, he's unselfish. I mean, does he pound his chest and act like a damned idiot? No, he doesn't. You know, he just plays. You know, so and you look at you look I at like the way that. I absolutely, like that. absolutely. <laughs> the way he stepped up his game this year, I mean, it's so much is on his shoulders. You touched on the defensive business. You know, for a good stretch of the season, he got the toughest defensive assignment every night. Well, that takes energy, and it takes it takes away from what you can do on the offensive end. But at the same token. He has become so much more now of a well-rounded offensive type player. He attacks the basket with authority. I mean, they preached at him. They hollered at him all last year. Be aggressive. Be aggressive. The best thing that probably happened to Keegan was spending this summer every day working out with the Aaron Fox. And they worked at the arena religiously. And Keegan has become so much more of an all-round player as a result. I think the gains that he's made in two years of time are just extraordinarily good. And I, I agree with Jerry. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to be a showman and you don't have to rant and rave and flail your arms and do all of that. Just do the job. And Keegan is the kind of guy from what I've come to know of him, if he doesn't have a good night, nobody takes it harder than Keegan. I mean, he is hard on himself. And I, I just, I don't know, I think he's got just a star-studded future. I just see him climbing every year and getting better and better. Well, Jerry, I like your, like your pissed-off energy, and I'm going to build off of that pissed-off energy a little bit. <laughs> Those who are, I've suckered in here to listen to my podcast consistently know that I can certainly go down a rant when it comes to DeMontis Sabonis <laughs> and how DeMontis Sabonis is looked at and how he's talked about around the league. Last night, DeMontis Sabonis came just the second player in history to reach 1,000 rebounds in a season, 600 assists in the same season. 70 double-doubles in a season, 57 straight. Uh, that, that stat that I just laid out, only Wilt Chamberlain has ever done that before. You may have heard of him, Wilt Chamberlain. Who? who? Some, some important basketball yeah. player from one point in time. Yeah. I, I don't understand. They've heard me yell about it, so I don't need to yell about it again. If you guys want to yell, at, yell about it, well, in, professionally, in a professional way, G-Man. Why do people talk about... Demonis Sabonis the way that they do? Or why do people not talk about Demonis Sabonis the way we talk about a Nikola Jokic or we talk about an Anthony Davis? I know those are first ballot Hall of Fame players, but Demonis Sabonis this season and even going back to last season has been doing things that really only one or two people or, or centers have ever been able to do and yet it's, let's see what they're going to do in the playoffs or it's not good enough or we need more from this, need more from that. I know you guys have heard it, you guys have seen it watching Sabonis every night. What is you know, we'll start with you, your reaction to just seeing number 10 do his thing every single night. Well, as far as social media is concerned, the people who make those statements are idiots as far as I'm concerned. They don't know what they're, they don't know what they're watching. They don't have a thorough sense or appreciation of his talent. And we were talking earlier, Jerry, and a couple of you folks here, about how you have yet to see Demata Sabonis. Now remember, last year he played with a broken thumb for crying out loud an entire season. He missed one game when he first had the injury. You don't see him take a day off. You don't see him take a possession off. He works his ass off night after night after night. And if you can't respect that, I don't know what you can respect in NBA basketball. And, and he's doing amazing things. And he's, he is the heart and soul of this organization. And heaven forbid anything happens to him because <laughs> I can't imagine what life would be like without Domatis. And, and it's easy to take it, you know, almost for granted. But man, is he something special. And Jerry, we, I, you are making the point that in the history of the 39 years of the Kings in Sacramento, you tell me who's been a better 
contribution or a better player in this organization than Demontis Sabonis. That's a good point. Sure is. Hard to fold out of. <laughs> well, and now, they I, you know, we were talking earlier, too. I said, I'm sadly, one of the, the things about being old is you remember a lot of stuff occasionally. But I, <laughs> I followed this franchise since they were in Cincinnati. The Cincinnati Royals became the Kansas City Kings, which I followed, obviously, in part of a little bit. And then, of course, the Sacramento franchise through the entirety. But like, And I can tell you for a fact, an absolute fact, he's the best center in the history of the franchise. Of the franchise. So, you know, sure, uh, you know, if you could, if you want to trade him for a Wimbanyana in the future, sure. I don't know that San Antonio would do that. But, but I'm just saying the reality is he's the best that we've ever had by quite a bit, by quite a bit. And so, you know, whatever criticisms he gets, just keep that in mind, you know, he's the best. And the fact that he wasn't an all-star this year is a total injustice. I just, I don't understand that at all. And I don't know if that's on the coaches around the league or what, but they don't look forward to playing him on a nightly basis, I know that. He just, should have been an all-star. Just ask Anthony Davis. I think Anthony Davis is yeah. terrified of, uh, of playing against Amanda Sabonis. But talking about... I, I, I'm, <laughs> Jerry's getting a hat here. I'm, I'm curious, Jerry, your perspective on this, too, because you've coached some, some great players over your time, some Sacramento legends in your own right. How much envy or jealousy do you have of Mike Brown for having not just a DeMontis Sabonis, but a De'Aaron Fox on his roster, a Keegan Murray, a Malik Monk. I mean, the, the Kings obviously still have a ways to go. They have aspirations of winning championships, and hopefully this roster can eventually get there. But to have a player as, especially as talented and speedy as De'Aaron Fox, I have to imagine as a coach, that's just a, like you, 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 that's one of the main reasons probably why Mike took the job. Well, obviously, they're, they're very talented guys. Now, am I jealous of, of Mike? Well, not really. I mean, he, he really has some really nice pieces. Now, I'm jealous of Phil Jackson and Pat Riley. I'd be jealous of them. Damn. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think Mike uh, has got some really nice pieces to work with, and he really has utilized them very well. I always said there's only two things a coach can do and that is motivate your players and utilize them correctly. That's it. And he does a terrific job at that. I mean, and so I, I just think he's uh, done a marvelous job. I don't, I'm a fan, so I don't agree with everything he does. But then again, he's right way more than I would be. Mike has brought a lot of different things to the Kings over the last two years. One of the things that he's brought is the defensive player of the game crown. But last year it was a defensive player of the game chain, and there's only one person on this stage who's actually gotten to wear that chain. Right over there. And that was G-Man. Yeah. I never saw him play defense either. <laughs> never did. He, he, I mean, you both got to broadcast tens of thousands of losses, I feel like. That's defending yeah. the franchise enough right yeah. there. Yeah. G, you've told me this before, but for, for those here that don't understand, is that thing real, that defensive player of the game chain? How heavy is that thing? It's heavy and it's real. I, I was amazed at it, yeah. it was, uh, And I was blessed because it was my 3,000th game and the Kings happened to win and we were in Oklahoma City and uh, they called me down immediately doing our postgame show. I had Sabonis on the postgame and down, I hadn't asked the first question and they were already giving me this signal from the floor to wrap it up. And uh, they sent... Uh, someone up to escort me down to the locker room, and I thought, something weird is going on. And so, uh, Jordy Fernandez is usually the one who makes the little spiel about who is uh, singled out for each game as Defensive Player of the Year. And, of course, in my instance, it was based on communication. An important part of defense is communication. Here's a guy that's done 3,000 Kings games and so on and so forth. So, I was, I was astounded and fortunate enough to be able to be awarded the defensive player of the game chain. And that was truly one of the most memorable uh, moments or nights uh, in my long broadcasting career. And it was, it perhaps didn't really hit home as, as it should have until late last year or early this year. Um, help me out, Jerry. The, uh, the guy that was a coach's agent that runs the summer league 
from the Dominican Republic, Warren Legary. Uh, he happened to see me at a game and he came up to me and he put his arm around me and he said, do you have any idea how significant that was that the team allowed you in the locker room and presented you with that? And he says, that is one of the greatest moments that you'll ever have in your career. And he said, and it, it kind of hammered it home and I, I don't want to, I'm not here to toot my horn, but it was just, it was significant. It was an amazing night. And uh, yeah, the chain is real, just like the crown is real and they have a throne that they now sit on. They don't travel the throne, but in the locker room for the home games. And the guys love that. And it's, a, it's an interesting little wrinkle. And you see the pictures that are posted each night as uh, whoever it is gets defensive player of the game. Well, you don't have to toot your own horns. We'll toot it for you. I think, I think we all will agree that when we got that, we finally got that moment in game one, Kings versus Warriors last year and how amazing that game was. I don't think there was anybody that deserved to have that moment more than you did, G-Man, to be able to call a playoff game after everything you went through. Yeah. So That's that was very a cool moment. Thank you. And to hear your call of that. And Jerry, I was trying to figure out a way to have the National Network just bring you on and let you do the game for the heck of it. Well, then I had to come to uh, my man cave and uh, get me out of my <laughs> recliner. So, uh, so I don't know if they can do that. <laughs> One of the other new things, Mike Brown didn't necessarily bring this, but when he started, it started, the beam. Yeah. The beam is now taking the, kind of the, the NBA lead by storm a little bit. But I think all of us, when we first saw it, had that thought in the back of our head of, well, that thing's not going to be lit very much because <laughs> it's only lit after wins. <laughs> well, Mike, Mike has shared with us when he first heard about it, he's like, this is kind of corny, this is kind of weird, but then it, it, it caught, it, 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 it's taken off and has a life of its own. But, Jerry, I'm very curious about your opinion on this as a self-called curmudgeon. <laughs> what was your opinion of the beam when they first brought that out after a win? This is going to surprise you. I loved it. I loved it. You know, I mean, I thought that, hey, that's a neat idea, you know. I mean, you know, what? I mean, whether you win a lot or, or win very little, I mean, it kind of gives some extra excitement. And, and certainly then even when they won on the road, you know, light the beam, light the beam. No, it's one of the greatest marketing uh, fan things that they could have done. I think John Reinhardt, I think, really came up with the idea, the president of the Kings, and a very bright man, very... Well, I love the fact that now this year, you know, they re-fortified it, re-intensified it. I mean, I live down in the Greenhaven pocket area, and I can see the beam when I come home on a winning night. I look out as I drive in the garage, and I can see the beam, and down in the deep pocket area. Well, and they're going to have to get that beam stronger so I can see it in Roseville. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Damn. We're working on it. Maybe after playoff series win, yeah, I'll get you get brighter. That, get that beamed up, baby. <laughs> um, where have you heard, G-Man, on the road, the light, the beam chants the loudest? Because we've heard a couple of times through the television it gets yeah. pretty loud, but... L.A. Gets, L.A. Yeah. LA. Yeah. Clippers or Lakers? Both. Both? Yeah. Either one. I mean, it's just, it's astounding. The last time, uh, about a month ago, we beat the Clippers on their home floor, and I swear, I, I mean, it was... It wasn't truly thunderous, but it was amazing how many Kings fans were there and how much energy they were creating and enchanting like the beam. And uh, it's happened in multiple arenas. It's really kind of caught on now as the Kings fan base around, uh, around the country. They chime in. Everybody loves the beam, and why not? I mean, it's, it's a tremendous uh, marketing ploy. And I love the fact now that they've got the whole situation where you actually light it, one of the players hits the button in terms of the, in front of the scorer's table, and you see the beam inside the arena, and it magically goes up through the rafters and then up into the night sky. It's, uh, it's truly, and I think the league uh, awarded some, had some special award for the Kings organization last year for the innovation that brought the whole business of the beam about. Jerry, what do we have to do to get you out of your man cave to come light the beam? You got to do it. Well, there's about 800 people ought to be ahead of me doing that, so I, I don't. Uh, you can still do it. Come on, Jay. Uh, Jerry. Can still no, no, there's a, anyway. Yeah. That's, that's the thing big. about Jerry Reynolds is the fact that not only is he a lovable curmudgeon, he's worn every freaking hat there is to wear in the King's organization, and people forget that. And there's a reason why his name is on a banner up in the rafters at Golden One Center. And this guy's done everything. And I, I just, uh, I marvel. At, at, and still, I occasionally send him a text 
I'm on the road somewhere and somebody will ask me, one of the administrators of the old timers say, how's my man JR, how's Jerry doing? You know, they, they're keeping tabs on you, brother. It's, yeah, well, I and appreciate it's, that. It's really, he is loved around the league and still is, that's great. Well, now I gotta tell you, that's not exact, I haven't had every job. Uh, I've never been Slampson. You gotta change that. And, uh, I don't know if I can do it now. I, there was a time when I might could have pulled it off. But I, we need Jerry to be Slamson with the, the bowling thing when they send Slamson into the there bowling thing. Sure. Can you roller skate? Put it on the blades? Hell, you know, I can't, no, I can't roller skate. All the better. We'll have yeah. Slamson. No. You can do the baby races or something like yeah. that. We, we, we'll start there. <laughs> Jerry, speaking of the, the, the banner that you're on, it's a Sacramento Monarchs general manager banner. Yeah. We have amazing women's basketball that's happening right now in the NCAA tournament. You hear the WNBA continuing to expand, expand. How much does Sacramento need the Monarchs back? Well, I think it, uh, I think they need it back. I thought it was a, uh, you know, basically the Monarchs drew better here than just about everybody, everywhere. I mean, we had a great uh, season ticket base. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a money maker, but but basically was losing less money than every other team in the league at that time. And so, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed my time. Uh, with the Monarchs, you know, being around people like Kara Lawson and Tisha Pinachero, you know, they were a lot of fun to be around, and and they won, yeah. you know, which was which was the thing then, you know, to have a champ, not just a championship team, but a championship contender, uh, several years. So yeah, that's a blast for me. I, you know, uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm not a very big fan of All-Star Weekend. Period. I got to experience my first All-Star Weekend last year in Utah to watch and. Watching it in person was pretty boring. Not one of the more boring experiences in my life. But this year, they, they did something different. In addition to the three-point contest, they had Steph Curry take on Sabrina uh, from, from the New York Liberty. And I love the idea of this. I think we're going to see a, a Caitlin Clark maybe in something like this, maybe an Angel Reese one day in something like this. But what was your guys' opinion on, on that, of implementing the WNBA more into what the NBA is doing and, and vice versa? Because it seems like more and more NBA players, Kobe Bryant was big on this as well, they're trying to turn more of attention to the women's game and how good the women's game is as well. As far as I'm concerned, that was the highlight of All-Star Weekend this year. Absolutely. Everything else paled in comparison to that. The dunk contest is no longer a dunk contest. The game itself is a total joke. It's an exhibition, and it's hard to even call it an exhibition. Yeah. And I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't have any any way of determining how you can improve it. I think maybe, maybe that thing is gone. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the All-Star game ceases to exist in the next two or three years. But there, there's, yeah, there's only one way that can save it. Well, I'm serious. I want you. I want you to pay close attention because <laughs> you're going to hear how you can save the All-Star game. Professor is at work here. Damn right. I thought about this, and this will. <laughs> I don't sitting think, forward in his chair. I don't think about a lot, but but have an American international game because because truth of the matter is, the majority of the best players in the world are international. You got Jokic, Adela Kupo, Joel Embiid, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Jamal Murray. I could go on and on. I mean, people don't realize that the majority of the best players now are not American. And I think that would make it really competitive. You know, you, all of a sudden, guys, because you know the, the Euros, they would come to play. Yep. And if and Americans would would know that if they don't bring it, they'd get embarrassed. I think he's on and, and I, I, that's that's if they don't do that, it, it probably is dead. And because uh, as it is now, if they had the All Star Game in the cul-de-sac outside my house, I would close the blinds. <laughs> well, you named a lot of MVPs there with those uh, international talent. Shout out to our MVP over here with the uh, the umbrellas up blocking yeah. the sun. Yeah. Absolutely. Only Kings fans do that. <laughs> Lakers fans would have taken this tarp down so it was in all of our eyes. We all know that. We fact. appreciate that big time. Hey, here's a question I got for you. Oh, no. Uh, Where's the restroom? I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, Jerry, if you go straight into the beautiful building of Sack Yard, yeah. it's gonna be right to the or to the left on the inside. Pass the bar to the left. Bring us all back some drinks. Oof. Okay, now he's gone. 
Now we can talk bad about him. He's gone. G Man, specifically, like, with over the years of, of broadcasting this team, I, I'm going to ask this question of Jerry, too, when he gets back, because I'm curious his, his opinion on it. But the game, we talk about how much it's adapted, how much Steph Curry ruined the game of basketball by changing what a good shot is. This player ruined the game. The game was better with the bad boy Pistons era when the game was more physical. You hear all this stuff all the time, but you've watched pretty much front row or top of the concourse <laughs> most of the time now. Yeah. You've watched how the game has evolved over the years, how Sacramento Kings basketball and the NBA in general has evolved. What is it? What is your favorite part of what the what NBA basketball is today and how it's changed for the better? I love the athleticism. Uh, it's amazing to me. You talk about Victor Wembanyama and you see the skills that he has on a seven foot three, seven foot four inch frame. Uh, when I see that, you get excited. And I, I love the fact that, you know, all, every player now wants to shoot the three. It doesn't make any difference if it's a guard, if it's a center. It's positionless basketball. I, I'm a realist. I, you know, you deal with what you have, the product you have to work with. And the game evolves. It's constantly evolving and changing. It'll continue to do that. And I think if you're a basketball fan, you go with the changes and you enjoy what's there to see. And I'm, I'm just, no, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to be involved at my age in calling basketball games and watching these great athletes night after night. Uh, it's it's a, a real blessing and it's a treat. And almost inevitably, you say, you'll see something that maybe you've never seen before. No matter how many years you've been following or watching the game, you see these athletes do something that just takes your breath away. And that's just so cool. Well, and you, you haven't missed a step. G-Man has not missed a step. If you still listen to him on the radio, he sounds the exact same as when I was a kid and, and when uh, you were 10, 15, 20 years ago, G. So keep doing what uh, you're, you're doing. I really appreciate it. You're very kind. I, thank you. We're gonna when Jerry gets back, we're gonna we have a we have a microphone down here. If you're interested in asking G or Jerry a question, you absolutely can do so. We'll open up to questions here for final few minutes before we wrap up. Thank you everybody who came. This is amazing. This is awesome. So thank you so much for doing this. Go to stay Frankie down here and Chris B. Hi. That is, guys. It's uh, yeah, we got we, Kevin over here. Yeah. The cowboy Frankie Cardicelli. Call him the cowboy, he loves that from Sacktown Sports 1140. He does amazing work for Sacktown Sports 1140, writing articles and covering the Kings for them. That's right. Shout out Frankie Cardicelli. Chris Biederman loves DeMontis Sabonis, big DeMontis Sabonis fan. He writes amazing Kings coverage for the Sacramento Bee. He's down here, so come say hi to Chris Biederman. Kevin John is my partner at ABC10. He's all right. <laughs> Mercy. Wow. Oh. Kevin's amazing, too. But, uh, and then, of course, we have Chris Verlot over here as well, who's a legend of Sacktown Sports 1140 as well. Chris B. Make sure you ask him about Manchester United. He'll, he'll be happy to tell you about Manchester United. And he loves Man United, definitely not Man City. <laughs> Jerry, we're going to open it up to questions here from, from them in just a second. But I just asked G-Man a question that I wanted to ask you. The game has evolved so much over the years. You are now in a position where you're a fan after all the many hats that you wore. What is it about the game today and how, just the, the state of the NBA today that makes you so excited or that you enjoy the most as a fan? Well, I really enjoy the game because of the fast pace, uh, the, you know, certainly the three-point shooting I enjoy, I think it's overdone, don't get me wrong. I, I think it's overdone, but, but I think what you have in general in the game today, you have the five best players on the floor. When I came to the league, and Gary knew this, I mean, every team had to have a seven-foot guy. Now, most of the teams, or certainly a lot of our teams, didn't have a good seven-foot guy. <laughs> and the other teams had good seven-foot guys. Rich so was, was a really it was nice a guy. It was a, a, <laughs> it was a big man, low post game. Yep. Now it's a perimeter game. But I think it, I like it because it really puts the best basketball players, the best talent, on the floor. And that's the way I've always thought it should be. Get your best players on the floor. What would have happened, Jerry, if... In a two-on-one fast break where your Kings had the advantage, Reggie Theus pulled up for a transition three instead of taking to the rim. What would have happened when you were coaching? Well, he had to come out uh, <laughs> because Reggie really couldn't shoot him very well, That's first true. of all. That's fair. But, I mean, at that time, he, he later became a decent three-point shooter because nobody shot him. Uh, you know, so it was a, a desperation shot as opposed to a 
So nobody shot transition threes at that time. I mean, Larry Bird didn't shoot transition threes. That's true. So, uh, so if he wouldn't shoot them, Reggie Thea shouldn't shoot them. Well, before we open it up to questions, any any stories that you guys want to share? We were talking a little bit over here about Arco One, and I've heard the story. I wish I got to experience it, but Kings and Celtics, Larry Bird coming to Sacramento in Arco One. What do you remember, not just of that game, but what do you remember of, of Arco One and just how this Sacramento community embraced Kings basketball when it first came here? Of course, it's grown to now we have the state-of-the-art Golden One Center in downtown Sacramento, which is unbelievable. That building is just incredible. still pinch myself every once in a while looking at it. I miss Arco Arena, don't get me wrong. Arco was my home away from home, and I'm sad they tore it down. But what do you remember about Sacramento first getting the Kings and Arco One and the environment in there? Well, for me, I mean, you're talking about the Celtics game, uh, obviously, and, and uh, Bird, the Celtics, and all that. I, I remember probably a little different uh, because basically after the game, we, uh, you know, we beat them. And Larry missed two free throws. And so he had to buy me beer all night. And, uh, and so I, that was an amazing night for me. And, uh, of course, that was kind of the little bet we side bet we'd have. Uh, and, and that's the last time that he had to buy me beer. I bought him a lot of beer after that. <laughs> I think of the, uh, I mean, just the amazing fan base. King sold out 497 consecutive games after they first came to Sacramento. And that still stands among the top 10 all-time sellout streaks in, in NBA history. And it was only, I mean, this was a, basically a warehouse that was slapped up by Greg Lukenbill and his company in nine months. And it seated 10,333. There were four suites, one in each corner. The locker rooms were about the size of this yeah. little stage here. Bill Jones would have to, the athletic trainer, had to tape ankles in the hallway outside. I mean, there just wasn't room to move. It was just jammed in there. But the energy and the hunger for professional sports amongst fans in Sacramento and Northern California was just something to behold. And it, and it made it so special. Uh, there's still a picture up in the media room that I get asked about frequently in a tuxedo interviewing Reggie Theus at center court. And on opening night, for whatever reason in Sacramento, a lot of people wore formal wear and, and uh, tuxes in one thing or another. Only in Sacramento, I guess. I guess. But, but that was what set the stage, which has now lasted 39 years. And we came so close to losing it about 10, 12 years ago. And that's another whole chapter in, in the history of the Kings that uh, provided so much anxiety and angst and drama and the fact that we persevered and we got the Golden One Center and uh, generations, you folks and your children and grandchildren, whatever, having a chance to see NBA basketball in person uh, I, I just, I love the fact that it's still here. It's thriving, sellout crowds every night this season. It's all good. We're very, very fortunate. Yeah, you know, a couple other things a little different, you know, is, is that, and as G-Man said, is all just miraculous experience, you know. And, uh, but I had the experience of being in a, an office with the late great Bill Russell and Willis Reed, <laughs> and it's a little bitty office, and it's just three in there. And I always said, you know, the toughest thing for me was to get used to Bill Russell's cackle. <laughs> I swear he about blew out my eardrums out, you know, because you know I had a tendency of saying something he thought was funny, and he'd just cackle and it's just about knock you off your seat. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but it was uh, really amazing, just to be, of course, with two great guys like that. But but the office space and stuff was just terrible. And and as uh, G Man was talking about the locker room, the visiting teams basically dressed in hotels. They'd come over because right. their yeah. locker room was about like a bedroom, and uh, so it was just a, a unique, a unique situation. Uh, you know, we'll never see in the NBA again. But I, I was really is neat that we could go through it. I mean, a lot of you hard to to imagine it, but it was a, it was a unique. You know, uh, cookouts and and people camping beforehand, and it was a, a remarkable and. 
you know, we made the playoffs that first year. That's right. We were, and we were the seventh seed. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> we were the seventh seed in the West, and won 37 games. You know, take me back to that. Yeah, well, it. I mean, it it goes, and you know, there were teams a couple of years ago in the East that won, were in the playoffs. At, I think at, at 36 wins, 35 wins. So you know, it goes and flows. But uh, of course, I also remember the old Kansas City Kings won 45 games and didn't make didn't the make play. it. Yeah, and didn't make yeah. the playoffs. So crazy. Great. Well, I think we should continue the tradition of having at least the Lakers and the Warriors dressing at the hotel and, and don't give them a locker room. <laughs> no, don't even let them dress. No. no. <laughs> they have to play no. in street clothes. No. All right. So before we wrap up, if anybody has a question for G-Man or Jerry or both, we have a microphone right here. Feel free to step up and we'll, we'll keep this going for like five, ten minutes or so. But come up, introduce yourself, and uh, they're, they're nice, I promise. <laughs> What's up, my man? How's it going, guys? Thanks Good. for coming out today. Uh, my name's Caleb. Um, I wanted to ask you guys' thoughts on the journey that Keon Ellis has had this season, going from, you know, undrafted, then, you know, getting the spot in the G League and the two-way, and then finally this year getting the, uh, the full, full contract in the NBA. It's a, great, uh, it's a great story because the guy comes out of uh, Alabama uh, undrafted, if I recall mm -hmm. correctly, and he signed as a two-way player. And then to earn a contract here a couple of months ago, I think it was early February, when they signed him to a standard contract. And to see his progression is a great story. But then to know how hard he works and how much he's loved in that locker room and how much he's respected is another part of the story. And obviously defensively is where he excels. I was just looking at preparing for tomorrow's game. The month of March has now passed us. Keon Ellis and De'Aaron Fox combined for, I think the number was 62 steals in the month of March. That's, a, that's an almost unheard of number for two players in a handful of games over the month of March. And to see him making those contributions and earning the trust of the coaching staff and being rewarded with an opportunity to start now that Kevin Herter is down, uh, just, a, just a great story. And it couldn't happen to a better young man in my estimation. You know, the, the one thing I would say to add to that is just from uh, watching the games and watching Keon uh, over the years, I remember him in college, in fact, but where he really helps his team, I don't know that he's a better individual defender than Davion. I don't think that he is. He can't put the same ball pressure on a guy. But he's, he's really better because he can switch on to bigger people. And so really he becomes, and he's got a little bit more of a team defensive ability. So he's got the instincts for it. I mean, and that's not, don't mean that's not putting Davy on down. I, but like I say, there's a little difference there. And I think it really fits with Fox. I mean, he's a better fit with Fox because they're both long and quick. And they, they really can put some pressure on guys. But, he's got uh, a wingspan. I don't know what the what it is, but he, he's got really long arms, and he helps defensively. He has good defensive instincts, I think, too. So fun to watch. Fun to see him succeeding. <laughs> yeah, I'll just wrap with this, too. I think Keon is a genius, not just with how he plays on the floor, but that's the, the best part of being undrafted is towards the end you can choose where you go. And he chose Sacramento, a team that's in desperate need of length and athleticism and wings who can shoot the three but also defend he chose the Good kings point. took a risk took two two-way contracts to get to where he's at and now i mean he's going to be a starter hopefully on a playoff team which and he's earned that so yeah. i think keon's incredible but excellent question thank you so much thank you all right my man what's up man hey long time viewer appreciate your show of thanks course. for the time guys appreciate the conversation not the sober things you know because we're in a really tough spot now in the season but i had to ask you guys with Malik Monk being out right now, do you think it's more of a forwards through fire situation with the Kings and where without Monk, if they can figure it out without him, they'd be even stronger once he comes back? Well, I don't think there's any question about that. You would be, if, if you can figure it out, if you can get the extra performance from each of these guys on a nightly basis, and it can't be just a one or two time hit, you, you gotta sustain it. And that's gonna be the biggest challenge even though you're down to the final eight games of this of this season. And as we pointed out earlier, six of them are against teams with winning records. So you've got to bring it. you got to get big contributions from everybody. Yeah, I mean, there's no downside. Obviously, if they can, it makes them not just 
stronger going forward, but of course you got to keep Monk, number one. That's the key, <laughs> definitely, man. I mean, yeah, so... Uh, and, uh, and it's not just a case of, of people, I think, misunderstand, and believe me, I don't understand the implications of the salary cap and bird rights and all of those things that they pay Monty McNair and Wes Wilcox uh, amazing amounts of money to deal with. But the Kings are abs absolutely handcuffed. There is an absolute ceiling of how much they can offer to Malik Monk. And I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of $17 million yeah. a year. And there are going to be other teams that I'm sure are going to be willing to up the ante. They've got cash available. Orlando. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, that's, going to be, that's going to be a tough decision for Malik, the Kings organization, and Man, I hope we don't lose him. Oh, yeah, well, the, you know, the other thing, too, I always say with whether the Kings can keep him or not, one thing you do know, about every team likes him, but a lot of teams don't have cap room. A lot of teams have their guards under contract, and they can't get out of them. And, and then plus, you know, with the Kings, there's also a, a potential of a sign and trade. I mean, so there's, 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 there's things. Now, in my opinion, will they be able to keep him? I think they will. Just because of that, just because of the, the teams that have cap room, you mentioned Orlando, but they've got a bunch of guards that are under contract, too. Uh, so I guess my answer is, yeah, there's, there's teams with cap room, but in general, the way I've saw it is they're not looking for guards. They're needing something else. So sometimes the rules help you, and I'm hoping this is the case. Of course, I'm, I'm very optimistic, not necessarily very... Not, I'm a fan, so I'm just looking from a, that standpoint. Yeah. I, I think coming into this season, too, we we figured, hey, the biggest asset that the Kings had, or the argument that the Kings had for Malik to stay or to convince him to stay was De'Aaron Fox. Your best friend from Kentucky is here, right? Exactly. But I think that's changed. Malik has talked a whole lot about his relationship with Mike Brown, and he specifically brought up how Mike has allowed him to be himself and given him the freedom to be kind of the chaotic energy that he has which to me is the best part about Malik. Sometimes it makes you go, oh God, oh God, oh God. Yes, great. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Malik. Yeah, because I wanted to ask, sorry to cut you, I wanted to ask, you know, because like King's culture is, is like none other in the NBA, you know? So, I mean, I know Malik talked about how he didn't like the booze, especially during that one game. But I mean, seeing the fans, seeing the energy, this new up and coming team building a new franchise and obviously playing that Kentucky connection, I think it's going to have an edge towards keeping Malik. I hope so. You know, I'll always be, I mean, Malik means King, you know what I mean? We're, hopefully we keep him. His whole lifespan, I mean, we love him, but, I mean, who knows, right? Well, you got to take care of your... Well, I think there's two things, and, and I don't want to, you know, pour water on anybody's hopes, but he has made it clear he'd like to start. Yeah. And, and, and I, and my experience in the league, and G-Man can <laughs> comment, but it, when, it, when it comes to money, let me tell you something. Uh, you can like your, your people... And, and would he give a hometown discount? I believe he would because of, of Monk and Coach Brown and his teammates. Would he give up six or seven million dollars a year? He'd be a damn fool. <laughs> no, he, and he's not going to do it. Especially with the, his NBA journey has not been easy either. It's been a tough no, no. Well, I, I always say, I mean, that was a deal. A lot of people thought, well, Chris Webber would leave. Uh, because he wanted to go back to do, but he could make a lot more money staying here. Yeah. Plus, you it, know, money. They break our hearts too. Yeah. Well, and, and I always say, you always keep in mind, and people forget this, and I, I know from experience that even if the player is thinking maybe something different, they have agents. And agents get paid a percentage of the money. <laughs> and if the money is more, they get more. So, I know that sounds a little devious, but that's the way it is. It's important to think about, yeah. Thank you, my friend. Very appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. All right. All right. The Umbrella Man. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Uh, thank the three of you guys for being here. This means a lot. Thank this you. Is, this is fantastic. Uh, this is specifically for Mr. G-Man. Could you take us behind the curtain a little bit and talk about your, your preparation into doing what you do? Uh, maybe your team that helps support you and kind of what goes, what, what's involved in, in um, doing what you do? Well, certainly in this day and age, it's so much easier than it was in the early days because of computer availability, the internet, one thing or another. There's so much disposal at your fingertips, and that makes the job easier. 
but I don't have a mind that retains things. I have to have reminders in front of me. And so I'm old school in a lot of respects. I have a legal type forms that I cut up and I have information on both sides and I put the roster down and I put all the basics, you know, the height, weight, years they played in the league, when they were drafted, where they went to school, um, and then little notes that pertain to their personal history, family relationships, other teams they played for, career stats, all that kind of stuff. Uh, when you face a team for the first time of a season, it takes more time to go through the media guide, and that is usually a, at least a couple of hours trying to glean information and get it, like I say, where I, I because I don't retain it, I have to have it there in front of me and things that I can turn to and rely on. So you spend three, four hours maybe when you see a team the first time getting that basic part of it set. Then you update the stats that are made available that are available on the internet and through the NBA. It's just, it's amazing what is there. And if you want to get into analytics and if you want to get into true shooting percentages and one thing or another, which I'm not a big fan of, uh, I don't waste my time doing all of that. But just give me the basics and have that there. So there's a couple of hours of work uh, there. Uh, I, in fact, I spent a couple hours before I left to, to come here because tomorrow I've got an appointment in the morning for an eye procedure. My eyesight has taken a huge nosedive here in the last few weeks, and uh, I can't wait for them and their laser to go in there tomorrow morning and hopefully I can see again. Because <laughs> I found out it's pretty damn important to be able to see <laughs> and what I'm doing. So to answer your question, it's just uh, everybody's different. Uh, we have a service over the last three or four years that provides us information on each team and each individual that's made available to us. And that's been a huge uh, help as well. So all in all, after you're seeing a team a second or third time, there's probably three to four hours of work that goes into each and every game. So that kind of, if that gives you a sense or a feel of, of what it's like, at least from my perspective. Hey, let, me, let me help a little bit on this. Because for years I traveled when we were together, and I, but I'd always sit behind G-Man on the plane. And as soon as we get on the plane, G-Man is starting to work for the next game. You know, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, he, he's working all through the flight. You know, we get in at 2 o'clock, he's working. Uh, my preparation, I get on the plane, I get a snack, and then I, then I try to take a nap. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's... And you were really good at that. I was damn good at it. <laughs> Uh, how many how many of your sayings, the hippity hop to the barbershop, did you prepare and how many of them were just off the dome? Most of them are just off the dome if there is such a, you know, you know I, mean, I don't know if that's a, a positive or a negative. But, uh, <laughs> they were legendary in their right. Yeah. Great question. Thank you so much. And I've seen G-Man's notes. G-Man writes that big on a, on a, he's like a master of cramming for a test on one note card. You get all the book's information on one note card. That was G-Man. Yeah. So. It's about twice as big now as it was 30 years ago. <laughs> At any rate. Welcome in. Welcome in. First of all, thanks a lot, guys. I uh, appreciate you guys being here. Um, we're pretty stoked on the roster that we have, but if we are looking to build on next year, what positions do you guys look for? Is there any, anybody in um, the college ranks that you guys would look to draft uh, with draft picks? Like, where would you guys look at that? Jerry? Well, no, I, I really think this team has a need for a real lively power forward. I, yep. I, I guess as a fan, and I've, and I've been on record on radio and different things saying a few years ago I wanted him to go after Bobby Portis of Milwaukee when he was a free agent. I thought he would be a perfect fit with Sabonis. Uh, they weren't able to get him. Then uh, l last year, my guy was Naz Reed of Minnesota. I said, you've got to get that guy. And uh, I thought he'd be perfect. And so now I've got a sleeper this year, uh, Jalen Smith from Indiana. He's not getting a lot of time, but the guy can, I'm convinced, can, can take it up a notch. He's lively, can shoot the three, block shots, protect the rim, perfect fit. So all Monty and them get out there and get yeah. it. And, uh, and, I, and, and to your other part, as far as college, I don't think there's a college guy that gets going to make a difference. And I think the window is such, you know, that to take another step forward, they're going to have to uh, make a trade, sign a free agent. Yeah. 
in today's game, everybody, every general manager, all you hear him talk about is you want length on the wings. That's what you hear over and over and over again. Jalen Smith, that's a great, great thought there. I like your sleeper, Jer. Yep. Yeah, I got very little to do with my life, so that's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, Weirdly, in, in a weird way, too, we kind of don't want the Kings to have a draft pick this year because if they don't make the playoffs and they keep their draft pick, it muddies up the waters for all the draft picks that Monty can use this offseason to maybe make a big splash, too. So mm -hmm. in a weird way, we're rooting against the Kings having a draft pick, at least first round this year. Second rounders, Vlade still has a treasure trove that he, he <laughs> let uh, Monty inherit. So the Kings have plenty of second rounders, but we don't want a first round pick this year. We want the Kings to be able to have the freedom to take a player or trade the pick if they want to. So great question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks again. So a couple nights ago when Davion came in and just shut down Tyrese Maxey, it felt like, make a big difference on a guy who was just on a heater. He comes in the game, shuts him down, reminded us a little bit about what Davion did in our in the first six games against Steph Curry, mm -hmm. where he kind of held him in that 30-point range. I remember looking at the minutes distribution in game seven and realizing Davion didn't really play a lot in game seven and wondering what happened there not really sure but when you look at Davion Mitchell and you see his journey you see sparks of him making a difference on the defensive end but not really consistently making a difference and I just didn't know if you all had a reason or you identified a reason why his impact on the defensive side of the ball hasn't really been stretched to a consistent manner any thoughts there well my only thought is is you know for a team that uh talks defense and preaches defense, I'd want to see my be best individual defender out there a little bit more. Uh, but having said that, I mean, I understand kind of the situation because uh, of the players that are ahead of him, but, but he's the best individual defender. He's going to, I always say in college, as I always is at Baylor, is one of those guys, he could stay in front of you and you couldn't stay in front of him. And, and now, and that, there's a real value in that, as you pointed out. I like Steph Curry. He can make it tough on Steph Curry. He ain't gonna stop Steph Curry, but he can make it tough. And uh, so there's a value. I'll say one other thing about him. I know that you know because he comes up in trade talks. And I always say, "Boy, patience is a virtue." I remember, I remember a lot of the same things that said about Davion was said about Kyle Lowry when he was at Memphis and then at Houston, and then he was traded to Toronto, and he became a, a not an all-star, just an all-star, but also a champion. You know, I, I would say the one thing about the NBA, we give up on guys too quick. You know, when they, don't, when, they, when they yeah. don't measure up right away, we, we, we it's kind of like quarterbacks in the NFL, you know, the great quarterbacks come out, out of college, and if they're not winners by the late in the year, they, well, he, he's a backup. I give Davion a lot of props from the standpoint that he went through this stretch in the middle of the season where he was getting very limited minutes and he had fallen basically out of the rotation. And uh, how do you keep your spirit up? How do you stay engaged? How do you stay prepared? Uh, one of the things that Mike Brown constantly talks about, you know, everybody makes a commitment at the start of the season. They all sign a, a mutual pact that they're all in. Well, Davion was on some rocky shoals there, and I, I think that he found a way, and I don't know if it was through assistant coaches or whatever, but he kept working and working, and then finally he suddenly got an opportunity to sneak back and get limited minutes, and the limited minutes have expanded now. And what Jerry says is absolutely so true about having the patience, having sticking with somebody, believing in them, and I think we're starting to see him evolve now into a more of an offensive threat than he has been at any time in his still young NBA career. But his knowledge, and I don't know, I don't know if any lights have gone on or if there's a sudden change, but just his ability to find the seam, to get to the basket on the drives, those have been good. He's worked diligently on his three-point shot that's still erratic, but it's much improved, I think, over what it used to be. So I, I think that he can still, he can offer a lot to this team. And we're going to need him over these last eight games and whatever scenario we get into in the postseason. 
because of the injuries and because of his consistent approach to the game. I, I, he's, I think he's mentally tough. And you know, when he came in, there, it was a joke about the, the coaching staff. They literally had meetings about how do you keep him from beating himself up because he worked so hard. His work ethic is unmatched. And I know, I remember a conversation with Bobby Jackson at one time in his first year, and he just flat out said, he said, that the hardest thing we have to do with him is to convince him that there are times when you have to just You've got to rest your body. You've got to take at least a few hours off because he's always in the gym and he's always working hard. Interesting yeah. young man. Yeah, just remember a couple things. John Stockton didn't start till his third year. You know, Steve Nash didn't Steve even Nash. start till his third year. You know, I mean, there, there were teams that gave up on him. I mean, Phoenix gave up on Nash, Dallas, the, the brilliant Mark Cuban wouldn't pay him, so he goes to Phoenix. Uh, you know, how many championships would they have had if, you know, of course, well, anyway, that's, uh, you know, it's, he, I mean, I always say with Mark, you know, he, he's a, he let us, uh, Jalen Brunson go too. Uh, you know, how's that working out, Mark? So, uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, it didn't end on the greatest of notes, but this month of March in general was brilliant defensively. You brought up the steal totals. One of the reasons for that was Keon Ellis and yeah. Keon getting more playing time, but I think also Mike figured out three guard lineups and realized I can get Davion and Keon out at the same time. He didn't have to pick one over the other, which was pretty much what it was the entire season. Well, if you play Keon, Davion can't play. If you play Davion, Keon can't play. Something you have both of them playing with Fox or with Monk at the time or with Herder at the time. So I think that was a big thing too is I think we're going to see more of those good stretches of, of Davion, like you said, because he's given more time to – not just play well, but also kind of screw up. And it's, the leash isn't like, oh, you screwed up, get out of the game. And I think we're seeing that more on the offensive end, actually, right now than the defense is, go get a shot. Like, that's the one thing about Mike. Mike is going to tell you, if you have an open shot, take it, which I think our players appreciate a, a lot. So, great question. Thank you. If there are more questions, then you guys don't have to dwell on this, but I spent the entire offseason wondering why Terrence Davis got so many minutes over Davion. I didn't know if you guys ever got an answer from Mike as to why, like, TD got so many minutes in Game Seven, or if that just confused me and nobody else got an answer or what. But I've been thinking about that a lot over the. Me too. <laughs> okay, you need to get a life. <laughs> <laughs> You're my guy. You're my kind of guy. <laughs> You're thinking too much. <laughs> You're thinking too much about oh, that. Sorry. Good to see you. Oh, hello. Hey, just quick question. Any reason why every team that we play against shoots career three-point percentages? They're open a lot. That helps. <laughs> It's been pretty interesting to hear Mike talk about how he had to go back to fundamentals of just closeouts. Like he talked about teaching the guys what you learn in high school, which is the high fives on closeouts yeah. and, and stuff like that, which you would think is basic, but since they started working on it, it's gotten a little bit better. A little better. Kind of. Maybe not against Dallas, but it got a little bit better. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. You're both legends. This is awesome. Thank you. Um, who, in your opinion, is the greatest Kings player of all time? This will decide, oh. fans. I'll let you go first. <laughs> I've never been one to say that there is one. To me, there's always multiples. And I think you start with Mitch Richmond. Yeah! Uh, he, was, he was pretty damn good in his career. Uh, whether you loved him or hated him, DeMarcus Cousins was pretty special. Yep. Chris Weber has been special, and we spent a lot of time talking about Dematis Sabonis, and I think that he he belongs in that group. So I, you know, that's not one, but that's among the candidates in my mind, right off the top of my head. Would you rather have C. Webb or Mitch? I think it would depend on the needs of the of the team that you have assembled. Did I dodge that? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. Well, well, I'll, I'll give you a name that probably had normally popped up. The best player in Kings history, Nate Archibald. Ah, Kings, not Sacramento Kings. He so, said there Kings. You go. Yeah. yeah. Loopholes, these guys. Gordon the Big O. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Well, Gordon the Big O. Big O played for the Cincinnati Royals. Ah, uh, gotcha. Now, yeah. the best player in the history of the franchise is the Big O. Yeah. 
if not close, case closed, over, don't discuss it. <laughs> All right, well, we'll you'll probably start thank to... Thank you. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Any, any last quick questions, or we'll start to wrap this up really quick. Are we good? I think we're good. Awesome. Well, before we wrap up, guys... This is an amazing treat for me. I've looked up to the both of you so much growing up. My mom already embarrassed me earlier about how much I <laughs> worshipped you guys growing up. So to, for you two to be willing to do this for me on the first ever live podcast, and that's incredible. So thank you guys so much for me for doing it. Also, thank you to Sackyard, too. Sackyard, the first ever local business that partnered with Lock On Kings. The first ever local business that wanted to be a part of our team. So I really appreciate that. Uh, this place is amazing. Don't just don't let this be the only time you come here. Every single Kings game, they have Kings games on. They have sports on all the time. During the summer, this place is great. During the winter, this place is great. I mean, it's, it's perfect all the time. You see this crowd out here, and it's even better on the weekend. So especially during the playoffs, win the Kings, win the Kings make the playoffs. When you're looking for a place to watch them play, make sure it's Sackyard if you can't make it to the Golden 1 Center. So. Appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. This is awesome. This is not, hopefully not the last time I do something like this. So thank you. Have a great night to both of you. Thank you guys so much again. And uh, go Kings. Light the beam. Thank you, guys. Thank you, folks.